Welcome everyone to tonight's webinar presentation. My name is Adam Boyd and I'll be your webinar host for this evening. We very much appreciate you joining us for the top five facts that every veterinary professional should know about canine influenza. And this presentation is brought to you by our friends at Virox, makers of rescue. Presenting this evening will be Dr. Natalie Marks. To give you some background, Dr. Marks obtained her DVM with high honors from the College of Veterinary Medicine at University of Illinois. She is a certified veterinary journalist and has appeared on Good Day Chicago, NBC Morning News, ABC, CBS, and NPR. While she was co-owner of Blum Animal Hospital, Dr. Marks actually led the practice to be the first fear-free certified practice in the state of Illinois, which was also the seventh certified practice in the entire United States. She's also achieved the status of elite fear-free certified professional. She serves on fear-free uh, scientific advisory board and presents on fear-free concepts at national veterinary conferences. We very much appreciate having Dr. Marks here with us. So on that note, I'll pass it over to her and we'll get started. Thank you, Adam and the Fear Free team. It's great to be with all of you tonight on a topic that I'm very passionate about uh, for many reasons, some of which I'll discuss later in the presentation. But um, one thing that I, I think is incredibly important today for us to all remember is that the world uh, does not have any boundaries, right? There are no borders anymore. And what happens here, what happens across oceans and in different countries and different areas of the world can easily end up on our doorstep, which is what happened to me in 2015. So I'm, I'm very passionate about educating about canine influenza. And specifically tonight, we're going to talk about some things that I've personally learned, but also just from a professional perspective, how can you as a veterinary professional and a leader at your practice, be more prepared, take the best care of your patients, both from a clinical science and treatment perspective, but also um, adding in that fear-free component. And then we're gonna close tonight, we're really gonna talk a little bit more about how can we make our hospitals as safe as possible in regards to disease transmission. So thank you again, or everybody uh, tuning in. We also um, just, if you're, as we go through this presentation, if, if specific technical questions arise, uh, Christy from Byrox is also in the chat and she is there to answer any specific questions that you have um, and may be triggered more specifically as we get towards the end of the presentation and, and start talking more about cleaning and disinfection. So thank you again to Virox for sponsoring this talk tonight, as well as for your ongoing commitment to uh, the continuing education of veterinary professionals like us uh, around the world, and also for your commitment to stopping the spread of disease transmission. So as we think about dogs coughing, and this is a snapshot of a dog mid-cough, <laughs> certainly a lot more graceful than I think I would look like mid-cough. Um, but respiratory signs are probably one of the most common things that we see in general practice, in shelter medicine, I mean, you name it. If you practice with canine patients, you've seen dogs coughing. And there's lots of different types of coughs, and certainly there's lots of different presentations and histories around coughs. But one very common misconception that has been around for decades is that when a dog comes in coughing, uh, it must be kennel cough until proven otherwise. It must just be because of Bordetella, not even recognizing the other components. Um, it must be because of the boarding facility that my dog went to, and that's the only place they get it, right? Kennel cough. And as a community, meaning a veterinary community, we have not done a great job unifying and aligning on other causes of cough. And specifically tonight, we're gonna to be talking about canine influenza. So as we go through this presentation, uh, a couple of the high points that I'll hopefully be able to discuss and, and sort of either refresh or um, introduce to you is the prevalence of canine influenza, right? Is it still a concern for us around the country as it was when we had our national outbreak in 15? 
We'll refresh again on the transmission. How do dogs get this disease? And why is that important? Of course, not just internally, but also as we're educating pet parents. And then what does it really look like in our canine patients? Does it look different from kennel cough and the other forms of respiratory disease? We'll go over some tips and tricks for diagnosing this disease and even answer the question, do I even have to diagnose it? Does it matter? And then we'll talk about prevention. Of course, veterinary medicine was, was built in preventive medicines. So we, we can't ignore that. But like I said, we're going to close out with some disinfection principles because we do not want your hospital to be a fomite or certainly a source of transmission to other patients that are coming in um, without this disease. So let's start with prevalence, right? Is CIV or canine influenza, is it still a concern? Well, this was the 2021 national map that Cornell put out looking at, of course, the prevalence of the H3N8, the original strain of canine influenza that was discovered on the Greyhound racing tracks of Florida back in the late 2000s. Um, the H3N2 strain, which is the newer strain that you're probably familiar with, again, that landed in the US in 2015. And then both strains, which is in that darker orange, and then recent outbreaks from 2021 in red. And you can see back in 2021, and unfortunately, um, we don't have a more recent from uh, the Cornell specifically in their task force, it's a pretty widespread disease. And certainly as you look at the orange in both strains, you can see that's the majority of the states will have both H3N8 and H3N2. Now, if you're tuning in from Arkansas, Minnesota, Oklahoma, Georgia, Delaware, from New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Virginia, or even Texas tonight, um, guess what? <laughs> there have been cases of canine influenza in your states that have been confirmed as recent as June of this year. So this disease is not going away. Uh, this disease is here, and unfortunately, this is probably even the, the cases that have been confirmed in 2023, most experts often, as you can imagine, surmise that that's a very significant underreporting, because we know that testing for respiratory disease is pretty sporadic around the country. Um, there are some practices and veterinary teams that are huge proponents of testing and some that will only um, do a scattered test strategy where they might test one or two a week just to sort of gather if there is a sense of what diseases are there. Um, and some that will only test during an outbreak, God forbid. But as of June, 2023, these states had confirmed cases and we know of course that there are certainly more. Now, if we look at canine influenza as a disease syndrome itself, we know a few very certain facts. We know that 80 to 90% of dogs exposed to dog flu or canine influenza will become infected. That's morbidity. So you can imagine if you have 10 dogs in a room and one dog comes in and is sort of that canary source, unfortunately, nine out of 10 of those dogs will end up infected with canine influenza. So this is a very, very efficient virus with transmission. The scarier part though to me is that 10 to 20% of the dogs that get dog flu will not show any symptoms or signs. And those are the ones that enter boarding facilities or grooming salons or our hospitals completely, again, asymptomatic but our fomites, right, are, are going to be routes of transmission to other dogs. So if you don't remember any other statement from tonight's uh, lecture, the one thing I want to say is avoidance is not a strategy with canine influenza. We cannot avoid this disease. Um, and so that's why, again, prevention and disinfection strategies are so important. And another study um, looking at Severe morbidity and even mortality found that one in five of those dogs with dog flu, so 20%, are going to develop severe symptoms. So these are typically signs and clinical signs that require significant professional intervention from teams as well as even hospitalization. So I, I bring up the I word, <laughs> immunology, 
not to stress everybody out because this is going to be, I promise, hopefully very, very painless, but I think it's really critical for us to just refresh on the respiratory tract and the immune system of our canine patients to understand why different preventive strategies have been developed and why on the flip side, canine influenza has been so successful. I think everybody on this call, whether you're a practicing veterinarian or technician, or I know there are some students on the call, welcome. Um, everyone should be pretty familiar with the respiratory anatomy of, of our canines, right? Starting from the nasal cavity, going all the way down to the pharynx and the, all the mucosa in the back of the throat, and then moving down through the windpipe or the trachea into the bronchus and then the smaller bronchioles. And when we think about protecting the body from respiratory disease, we have to think of the entire respiratory tract. Because if we don't, we certainly can ignore some of the components that either have natural defenses or in some cases, unfortunately, can have impaired defenses and put a dog more at risk. So the two immunoglobulins that we need to remember that are very, very important parts of a dog's immune system are IgA, which is a key protector of our upper respiratory tract. Way to remember that, of course, is that upper is at the beginning and A is at the beginning of the alphabet. So hopefully that will keep those two paired in your mind. IgA, as I'll talk in just a few minutes, is incredibly impressive immunoglobulin. It, its mucus is able to actually trap pathogens, sort of like Ghostbusters slime. And it has the ability to neutralize organisms and other pathogens that are coming into the upper respiratory tract. So having a ton of IgA is a really good thing. And that's certainly one of the goals of veterinary teams when we're talking about preventive strategies. Now on the flip side, we have IgG, which is down in the lungs. And that's a key protector of our lower respiratory tract. Now, the thing to remember about IgG is that that is stimulated by injectable vaccines. IgG is farther down in the alphabet. It takes longer to produce it. IgA is pretty quick, again, at the beginning. IgG is the one that comes in later on. That shouldn't be a surprise to you if you think about injectable vaccines and how they work. Remember, it's going to take a little bit longer for us to see the body-wide or systemic response, meaning IgG production. So why do I bring this up? Why is that important? Well, that's one component of our defense, again, when we're trying to build protection for our canine patients. But the other part of this anatomy that plays a role in respiratory disease is the mucociliary elevator. Um, some people also call it the escalator, depends, depends who you trained under. But this is, if you think about, um, a weak field sort of blowing in the wind, or if you think about what we know about the gut with the finger-like projections, the trachea of a dog and obviously other species is lined with these beautifully efficient and effective cilia, these hairs that are flicking things always upward. And you see that sort of presented towards the bottom of the slide. When the goblet cells that are intermixed with this secrete this mucus that contains IgA, the mucus traps the foreign materials around um, within this elevator. And then the cilia, again, sort of in this rhythmic motion are beating and moving that mucus entrapped ball of pathogen towards the laryngopharynx so that a dog can either swallow it and be digested in the stomach by acidic contents or have ex expectoration, again, a coughing or sort of that gag cough to get rid of it. And that's again, the natural defense, it's beautiful, right? Uh, of a canine patient, again, very similar to what happens with us. I love this picture. <laughs> if, you're, if you can't already gather, I'm quite nerdy, I own it. But I love this electromicrograph actually depicting what happens with this mucus cell, mucus globule from the goblet cells, trapping bacteria around it. And you can see it kind of crowd surfing sort of on the top of the cilia that's being beat up and away from the lower respiratory tract. That's a critical part of function for the body. And in fact, when we don't have the mucociliary escalator or elevator, again, depending what you wanna call it, we end up with a blunted trachea 
and basically this open tube where pathogens can go directly into the lower respiratory tract. That blunting is what para influenza does, again, not to be confused with the CIV we're talking about tonight, but that is actually a very co common culprit of co-infection with canine influenza. Para influenza comes in and blunts these important cilia, then CIV is a pathogen, can evade these mucus, mucus um, globules with IgA and go all the way down and create more severe disease. So tip one, we want that IgA containing mucus. It binds pathogens and reduces or prevents infection. It reduces clinical signs of disease. It reduces shedding and duration of disease. All of these are incredible positive consequences when we have a very strong, again, upper respiratory defense mechanism really generated by production and also refreshing, right, of production of the IgA immunoglobulin. So understanding how our respiratory tract works, let's shift for a minute to understand what is happening when our patients do get canine influenza. So just for a minute, hopefully everyone can hear this really, really heartbreaking cough from a chihuahua. I play this cough because I've heard, as I've lectured since 2015 on CIV, I often hear from colleagues that I can totally pinpoint a, a CIV cough. I know what canine influenza sounds like in my patient, and therefore I don't need to test or again, I can do avoidance strategies. And once I hear that cough, I'll just isolate that dog and all will be fine. Well, this dog actually had a myriad of infection, actually was infected with three different pathogens, none of which were CIV, even though this, this case was sent to me from a colleague who swore, I've got it. This is my first case of CIV. I know exactly what it sounds like. I'm just gonna isolate. So I think I, I only bring this up for awareness that a cough can be any of the pathogens in CIRDC, which we'll talk about in a second. And canine influenza does not have a pathognomonic sound where we can diagnose simply on exam. The other part of CIV transmission that I want everyone to be aware of, and certainly when we're educating our clients and pet parents, is that there is a misconception as well that this is just a disease of boarding or grooming or high communal area dogs. However, respiratory disease and transmission happens when dogs come within four to eight inches of each other, which is simply a neighborhood walk, right? Or meeting in the lobby of your high rise or walking by each other in a dog run or sitting on a patio next to somebody outside. So this is a disease that can put, there are many more dogs that can be at risk of transmission than we often find on perhaps some of our non-open-ended history questions. So again, keep that in mind as we're thinking about this disease, that transmission certainly um, is a much easier than I think many of us think about. So going back to that chihuahua, right, we know that CIRDC is sort of the umbrella disease syndrome that we are referring to here, canine infectious respiratory disease complex. And there's a multitude of pathogens under that umbrella, bacteria, viruses, um, also some will include fungal organisms as well. And it's influenced by not only the patient's immune status, but also environmental factors. So canine influenza is just one small spoke in this wheel. And again, does not have to live within that patient alone, certainly can also survive and sometimes be influenced by co-infection. This chart may be um, helpful for a lot of you to screenshot, not just to help maybe your teams that aren't able to join us tonight, but also I think it's really helpful evidence when clients come in, and I, I know many of you, if not all of you, have probably had this scenario, who have a dog that's boarding, and the dog goes in on Friday, quote unquote, normal, gets picked up on Sunday, and Monday starts coughing, and all of a sudden they blame the boarding facility, which may be your hospital, right? 
or they blame coming into the hospital and something happened at the hospital. Well, we know that there are incubation periods, of course, for all the respiratory pathogens. When we're specifically talking about H3N8 and H3N2, those have, again, with H3N8, one to five days, H3N2, two to eight days. We know for the majority of those cases, it's on the longer range, so typically four to eight days. But there is significant survival time in the environment if we aren't careful about disinfection. And these dogs, unfortunately, once they have infection, can shed the virus for a significant period of time. The H3N8, and again, I'm going to reference that as a little bit more of a weaker strain, so tends to have milder clinical signs in our patients as compared to the more virulent and more um, uh, higher morbidity strain of H3N2. H3N2 can absolutely shed um, in the post-infection stage for 21 days. So if we compare that to Bordetella, we compare that to some of the other viral diseases and certainly to mycoplasma, there is a quite a variance there, right? And, and again, just another critical factor when you're coming up with respiratory disease vaccination protocols at your practice, thinking about prevention, again, avoidance is not a strategy, but also how do we appropriately disinfect so that a dog coming into our hospital is not going to pick up one of these viruses and specifically tonight again, canine influenza. Now, just as a quick review, of course, we have lots of different influenza strains, H3N8, H3N2, we think of it humans, H1N1, um, swine flu. Just so everyone's on the same page and understanding why they're named this, it's named by the characteristic two proteins that are on the, the surface of the cell. So if you look at the red ones in this diagram, that's the hemagglutinin protein. They go anywhere from H1 to H18. This is how the virus actually attaches to the host cell within the, the body. And it's the primary antigen that is the stimulus for the protective antibodies that are produced by our canine patients. When we look at the yellow, which is the upside down lollipop on this diagram, that's the neuraminidase protein. So that goes anywhere from N1 to N11. This is a super cool part of canine influenza, in my opinion, because what this protein does is it has enzymes that liquefy mucus. So remember our goblet cells back in the escalator or elevator, whatever you want to call it, that are producing that mucus containing IgA to trap? Well, this is the virus's answer to that is it has that enzymatic activity to liquefy that, and it also aids in the release of viral particles from infected cells. So just keeping that in mind, this is how influenzas are named, again, both in canine and also actually all the species. And we also, within influenza, have a concept of antigenic drift and shift. And what I mean by that is there are, it's certainly, we know, human influenzas, avian influenzas, swine influenzas, and then of course canine influenza, and certainly those that have crossed over into feline species. And the reason for that is that birds have a certain receptor within their lungs that makes certain strains of influenza um, pathogenic, I guess is the best word to say. And that's the alpha-2-3 receptors. In most mammals, though, they have the alpha-2-6 receptors. So birds and mammals don't exactly have the same lock and key mechanism for influenza, the same strains to affect. But pigs have both. So pigs are basically this melting pot, sort of this mixing bowl to allow shift and drift of different strains so that they can mix. And that is why we're able to see influenza jump species. Um, and that was a critical component, of course, of how we ended up with H3N2. Now, H3N8, um, and this is a very, I think, interesting uniqueness to us, to our canine influenza viruses, is that compared to human influenza, of course, we have a new vaccine for flu every year, right? With canine influenza, it's evolving at a very, very low rate just less than two amino acids per year since its emergence in dogs and again in the late 2000s. So that's why when we are talking to pet parents who, again, their frame of reference is their own body and they in human medicine, the flu vaccines have tremendous variability of composition. 
we have a much more secure confidence in that the vaccines that have been created, in fact, some from strains from my hospital in 2015, are almost the exact same strains that we're seeing today. And we're, we should feel good about that because it should, again, provide confidence and reassurance that we are targeting what, of course, we're trying to prevent. Now, H3N8, again, uh, originated back in 2007 in the, the Greyhound tracks in Florida, but you can see up until 2015, it didn't take long for us to see really active pockets all over the country and still, of course, today. Again, thankfully, although this was the sort of um, canary strain found in our dogs, it is thankfully one, um, the, the weaker version that we currently have, and typically dogs with H3N8 will not stray into the severe signs. Now, 2015, we had a totally different story. So um, my practice actually in Chicago here um, was the epicenter of the H3N2 strain landing in, um, in US soil. We still do not have definitive proof as to where this came from. However, there's high suspicion that this did originate from uh, South Korea and most likely originated again from avian origin, um, probably mixed with swine somewhere and then was able to of course jump into canine patients. But we started seeing a very high cluster of respiratory cases in spring of 2015, right before spring break. Um, testing began in late March of that year. We had at our hospital, um, almost 400 samples that were being tested for, at that point, we, we had no idea, to be honest, uh, because a test for H3N2 did not exist um, at the time of sampling. But once we sent our samples over to Cornell University to Dr. Ed Debovi, who's one of the world's leading experts on canine influenza, they were able to do the initial PCR testing on the M gene. And that genetic typing revealed that we actually did have a brand new influenza again, which is H3N2, a much more virulent disease and certainly um, one that was incredibly scary to many of us dealing with this initial epidemic because we did have mortality associated with this as um, which did not fit the bill with the H3N8 cases that we were used to seeing. So how do these dogs get CIV? Well, there's four routes of transmission we need to be aware of. There's dog to dog, there's coughing and sneezing, aeros aerosolization. So that means um, certainly if a dog is not in direct contact with another dog, but is in the vicinity where a dog just coughed or sneezed and had particles, they can certainly get it that way. Contact with contaminated objects, which we'll refer to from now on as fomites. And then actually we humans, can be a source to dogs. Um, and unfortunately, again, that's because we can be fomites and this disease can live on us for a period of time. So again, not to sound like a broken record, this disease cannot have a strategy of avoidance because there are too many routes of transmission and the disease, you saw how effective this virus is with sort of that dual protein attack and defense mechanism. It's quite virulent and has a very high morbidity. There's also been, since 2015, quite a few studies looking at not just prevalence, but also where does this disease live and what areas in the veterinary community, what activities, what settings, um, what other engagements where there are communal dogs are we missing? Because when it started in 2015, as I'm sure many of you remember, it wasn't long before Chicago became Atlanta, before it became at South Carolina, then it became the whole Northeast and spread throughout the country like wildfire. So there was a lot of work being done uh, by Jason Stoll, who's a leading veterinary epidemiologist at, at Guelph Atlantic Veteran College and also associated with the Ohio State, um, looking to see what are we missing? And this was a really interesting study um, that was done to look at dog shows and how prevalent things were happening at these dog shows and how there wasn't a great source of education for a lot of the breeders um, showing families as well as associated teams that were there. So um, a really interesting sort of 
eye-opening experience working with a brand new disease that I was able to take part of. Very grateful for um, the journey that I was on with a lot of these experts. But again, bringing this up just simply to show some historical context, but also just like when I showed you about the four to eight inches for respiratory transmission, we need to be very, very cognizant of the history questions we're asking of our clients to make sure we truly can get a sense of this dog's exposure to other dogs, um, because it happens much more frequently than most uh, families will admit. So tip number two, don't be an awesome fomite, <laughs> whether it's you or your hospital or your team, because we know canine influenza can live on our hands for 12 hours, it can live in the environment for 24 hours, and it can live on organic substances like clothing, and blankets and towels for up to 48 hours. So this is a disease again, that is, um, has a, a shorter incuba incubation period than some, but once it's in the area and remember 10 to 20% of dogs with CIV are not symptomatic. It, that's why it's important to understand we can't avoid this, this disease. We can't listen to a cough and know it's CIV. And we certainly can't um, sort of pick and choose which exam rooms and areas of our hospital and certainly our own clothing and hands and exam room tools that we disinfect. This needs to be a widespread across the board strategy that you pick for your hospital because again, this will be here whether you have diagnosed it or seen it or not. So what does this look like in our patients? Well, just like most of our respiratory patients, we're gonna see very ambiguous, but common clinical signs, coughing, sneezing, nasal discharge that can be serous or mucopurulent, ocular discharge, again, the same, uh, serous or milky white or, or purulent. Some of these dogs will have a, a fever, an elevated body temperature, they can be lethargic. And then the dogs that have more severe signs, which unfortunately we saw in the very naive population, can develop a CIV induced pneumonia, which for many of our dogs ended up with them being on ventilators. So again, remember that when CIRDC hits, CIV being one component of that, the way that that affects the body, our canine patient depends on that dog's immune system, environmental factors, and of course, what we've done to try and protect that dog as much as possible. Just a refresh, remember of our respiratory tract in here showing mostly our lower respiratory tract. CIV, when it does go into the lower respiratory tract, creates a pretty significant bronchiolitis. So that's inflammation of those primary bronchi going down into the secondary bronchi, tertiary bronchi, and then down to the very small bronchioles. Bronchiolitis produces a pretty significant cough. So for any of you that are parents that have dealt with a child with RSV, that also produces a severe bronchiolitis. So that sort of seal honking cough can be present. Now, again, that's not pathognomonic for CIV. We can see that with any of the CIRDC um, pathogens, but CIV does have a predilection to targeting this if it does reach the lower respiratory tract. So while um, a physical exam alone cannot give us a definitive diagnosis on the pathogen at fault here, it can give us a few clues. So remember when we are auscultating our lungs, certainly in a patient, there's four, there's four indicators, but three specifically I wanna talk about tonight. So dullness, right? Especially if it's asymmetrical, really suggests pleural disease. It would make CIV here less likely because we know that pleuritis is typically not an associated syndrome with CIV. Does not exclude it, but less likely. However, crackles, especially if they're coarse crackles, we can see with pleural fibrosis or chronic bronchitis patients um, that does not, again, always have to be chronic. It can certainly be also acute, but that's typically what we think of with crackles. And then wheezes, though more specifically, are pretty closely linked to bronchial disease. So when those dogs come coughing, please don't just go, ah, I hear it, I know what it is. Get your hands on those patients, get those stethoscopes in your ears, make sure you're listening to all quadrants of the chest, of course the heart, but specifically the lung fields and the caudal lung fields to make sure we don't hear dullness or wheezes. 
very important for screening the health of the bronchioles. Now, how do we know it's CIV, right? I've sort of poo-pooed the whole, I can hear with the cough, I know it's CIV. Sometimes we don't even know if a patient has CIV, right? Because they, they're asymptomatic. We have two different strains, so does it matter, right? Timing is really everything. So I want to get into diagnostics a little bit here and start talking about um, some of the ways that we can obtain um, a diagnosis, but also how to make that as comfortable as possible for the patient. Um, with COVID-19 affecting everyone globally, and many of you, if not all of you, going through multiple testing potentially for, C for COVID, we know that nasal swabs are not the most comfortable <laughs> experience, right? Um, but for CIV, and I would say for respiratory um, PCRs in general, we have a couple options, oral pharyngeal, which are preferred, but conjunctival and nasal swabs are also um, very effective ways of obtaining samples. We want to make sure that when you are obtaining these samples that you're using a sterile plastic handled swab, not wood or cotton, which those swabs can actually deactivate the virus on the way to the lab. So even if you have a patient there, you may get a, a false negative. You want to break those off and put it in a red top tube, ship with one ice pack via overnight delivery, and then refrigerate or freeze it if it's not being shipped and that can stay for 10 days in, in your freezer. And these are the Cornell guidelines, which have been adopted by most of our outside reference labs. So as we look here at our patients, you see kind of in this A through D um, segment, A, you can see they're doing a nasal swab, um, B, a deep pharyngeal swab, and then breaking off that tip and putting that into the red top tube. Now there are gonna be some patients as you're doing general fear-free strategies in the exam room, right? Considerate approach, um, making sure that you're using T-touch and starting at the least stressful areas of the body and working your way up, keeping continuous contact on that, on that patient's body so that we're not deactivating and activating the central nervous system um, every time you re restart your exam. But there are going to be some patients that are certainly um, head and face resistant to being touched or their fear, anxiety, and stress has started to escalate as an exam goes on. So a couple tips when we're thinking about doing this. One is, is if you are screening your exams and cough is one of the reasons they're coming in, I often will start with this diagnostic test um, using um, one of the strategies that I think works best, which is if it's a patient that has a um, history of FAS scoring, I will put a vertical lick mat attached to the exam uh, table if they're a large breed dog, or I'll have the client hold and allow that dog to start with a high reward treat. And again, using my considered approach coming parallel to the shoulder, touching the shoulder, then I will let them lick, gently do a nasal swab, and then let them go right back to licking with continued pressure. Now, some dogs are much more inclined to allowing you to do pharyngeal swabs. So if you have a dog that's taking treats, so say you're throwing them up and they're opening their mouth for that, then I will do several of those treats to let them go ahead and eat. I will grab a pharyngeal swab. This is not affected if there are food um, crumbs or residues in the back of the throat. And then I will immediately restart treating. There are, however, a few dogs um, that will not even tolerate that. And I welcome using pre-visit pharmaceuticals or appropriate reversible sedatives and anxiolytics, again, making sure that's appropriate for the patient's physical status and stability. Most of our milder cases of CIV or even some of our more moderate cases, as long as the lungs are clear and I have, a, again, a, a stable patient that can tolerate sedation, I will use reversible sedatives um, or even a, a short acting injectable to make sure that I can obtain my sample. Because this is tip number three, and this is probably one of the, the biggest tips that I learned throughout my um, tenure of epidemic in 15, is that if you're not looking for it, you're not gonna find it. I've talked all over the country and I don't know how many states, so forgive me, um, talking to colleagues about CIV uh, since 2015, 
And the number one response that I get from um, colleagues that I, I guess are, are just sort of trying to understand the um, spectrum or prevalence of this disease is, I've never seen it. You talk about it. I know you saw it. I've never seen CIV at my practice. And I would wager <laughs> that you probably have, but you didn't recognize it was there. And the other part of that is remember, if you are using collection strategies that are not what I described, you can have false negatives, meaning that you're not thinking about this disease. Remember, co-infection exists, which is why we should test. I, I have been burned myself by thinking, oh, well, this is a congestive heart failure patient, can't have CIV on top of it, right? The cough is from heart failure. Well, those dogs and collapsing trachea dogs and pulmonary um, fibrosis Westies and all everywhere in between, they can have a concurrent infection with CIV. And most importantly, remember, there are going to be dogs walking into your practice that have CIV and are asymptomatic. So avoidance and isolation are not strategies that we can choose to be effective at preventing this disease in our immediate community and also the spread. So speaking of prevention, right? What do we do with virus disease? Well, our goal is to stop the spreading and to stop the shedding. And to do that, of course, vaccination is, is a core principle. If you've looked at the most recent AHA guidelines, I love how they are presenting this now because it really talks a lot about what does core mean, right? I think we all understand that there are certain core vaccines that we should do in every canine patient that is healthy enough to receive vaccination. And then there are lifestyle vaccines that we think about uh, the 2022 guidelines, which are shown here, recommend, again, leptos, well, I guess, categorize those as uh, leptospira vaccines, Lyme, Bordetella, and also canine influenza. But remember that every canine patient we see has a different core. So there are going to be dogs where their core means the core that we typically think of, distemper, adeno, parvo, parainfluenza, and rabies. And may, that might include leptospira, Lyme, Bordetella, and canine influenza. There may be other dogs well, where their core is only the cores that we commonly think of, distemper, adeno, parvo, parainfluenza, and rabies, and are so isolated that they don't have any of the lifestyle vaccines as their core. What I'm getting at is we can't... Um, do, don't do what I did, which is, I've learned so much along my two decade journey here, but we can't just make vaccination strategies black and white. This dog gets core, this dog gets core and lifestyle. This dog gets core and one lifestyle. This dog gets um, only lifestyle. It, it's not that simple. Every patient needs an individualized plan and core for one patient is maybe totally different for another. So I think AHA is really trying to get that shift on board. And I love that thinking because it does allow us to have that shared decision-making with a pet parent and really, again, ask those open-ended history questions about where does your dog have exposure to another dog within four to eight inches of their nose, right? Is it in the lobby of your high rise? Is it on a walk, which it usually is, dog parks and daycares and beaches and patios and walking to your mailbox and traveling and rest stops and grooming. And you get my pit, my point, right? We need to open up a pet parent's eyes to where the risks of this disease and other respiratory diseases are so that they understand the value of vaccination. And again, even though these are categorized as lifestyle to some dogs, these will be core. Now, forgive the blurriness here, but I, I want to just quickly touch base on why, again, community vaccination strategies are so important, right? We think about herd immunity. When 2015 hit and H3N2 virus landed on my doorstep here in Chicago, there was no herd immunity amongst the dogs of Chicago. They were naive. So what I mean by that is the top of this has those open circles. These are susceptible patients. Think of these as dogs in Chicago, right, in 2015. When, um, when we're looking at an outbreak, meaning that first circle there is the, is 
case number one, most viral diseases with one patient can spread to four patients. And then that blossoms into this um, sort of bell curve and outbreak, right? Through transmission. And this is in a naive population where there's no vaccine strategies. So if you're in an area of the country that has experienced an outbreak, this is why. Because there hasn't been a, a unified vaccination strategy to help protect and create that antibody response in the population. But when we start protecting dogs with vaccination, and you can see the difference here is that we have that one susceptible dog at the bottom in the open circle, but those closed circles are dogs and represented here in our story that have been protected, that have immune strength, that have been vaccinated and created an immune response. You can see the transmission now is just one to one versus one to four. So we don't get that exponential outbreak. We don't get things getting out of control. We have slow controlled disease spread if that's what's happening. And that's really the goal of herd immunity. And in this case, again, protecting our immediate communities from respiratory disease outbreaks. Now, vaccination was one of the cores of prevention. But the other core, of course, is trying to eliminate or significantly reduce those routes of transmission, right? And one of the big ones, of course, is making sure that our hospitals, that we as is obviously humans, but also giving our pet parents guidelines on how to properly disinfect. Now, quick little viral review, right, of our viruses. You remember back to school envelope versus non-envelope. This is important here. And just a quick cheat sheet. Remember envelope viruses are the weaker ones. They have to have this envelope around them because they're really wimpy. They have a lipid membrane. They're easily destroyed by disinfection. Thank goodness CIV is in that group as is distemper and pneumovirus, herpes, FIP, and rabies. But the non-envelope viruses, they're more difficult. They don't have a membrane because they don't need it. They're tough and they're not easily inactivated. And that's things like parvo, which we know lingers for a long time, adenovirus, feline calice, and hepatitis. So thankfully CIV is pretty wimpy, which is great for us, right? Because that should help us with disinfection. But what I want to just quickly talk about is the difference between cleaning and disinfection. Because that is not something that I think that many of us really have a gauge on. When we are cleaning an area, we are removing visible debris and odor and making an area look better to the naked eye, right? But cleaning does not equal killing a pathogen of concern before our next exam. Many disinfectants do not have a dual action of cleansing. That is really important to remember. So before using a disinfectant in our hospitals, we have to remove all the organic material first. So that would be, of course, feces and urine and blood, respiratory secretions, but also dirt and even soap. It all has to go away before we use our disinfection. And, and yes, even soap, <laughs> because if you spray a disinfectant on top of soap, it will deactivate many of them. So don't forget that. And don't forget that we need to remove excessive water before we apply a disinfectant. If you're using a diluted concentration of a disinfectant, and then you put it down on a wet surface, it dilutes it even more, and then we lose efficacy. So really important, I think, to understand the distinction between cleaning and disinfectant. Now, there are lots that we use um, or have been um, used in veterinary medicine up till today. Um, I'm sure many of you are familiar with some of these common names and may even be using them currently in your practice. But what we know from studies of experts, both in human medicine and veterinary medicine, as well as understanding the shorter contact time, speed of kill, the positive effect that it has on our patients versus a negative effect in consequence, the experts agree that accelerated hydrogen peroxide cleaners are the wave of the future and what we should be doing now. Um, what we think about is, at least in our world, Excel and Rescue are the ones um, that are, are there. And one of the beautiful parts of using the accelerated hydrogen peroxide cleaners as, com appeared, as uh, compared to the others is that we eliminate the concept of nose blindness. 
So from a fear-free perspective, if you're not familiar with this term, when bleach is used in the exam room or some of the other cleaners, it can create destruction of dog and cat olfactory cells, which leaves them with nose blindness and inability to smell for sometimes up to a week. Not only, again, does that create a, a deficit, of course, in their sensory perception, but it can actually create a, a sense of emotional fear, anxiety, and stress um, because cats are so reliant, especially on their senses. So we don't want to create that un unnecessarily or ever, if possible. And we want to have low tissue toxicity and, and no toxic fumes, of course, within our exam room. I think one common fallacy is that, you know, when in doubt, just use bleach, that'll do it. But I think the thing that most people don't remember is that while bleach is a really inexpensive disinfectant, it's not a cleaner. Remember the difference between cleaning and disinfectant. And actually bleach will inactivate when it touches dirt and again, cause severe nose blindness. So when you're thinking about your strategies in your hospital, I really wanna encourage you to think about this chart certainly efficacy, safety, low toxicity, and, a, and again, that fear-free strategy of eliminating nose blindness. Couple different options that you have, again, not just we're talking specifically about canine influenza, remember that weak envelope virus, but just in general for disinfections to eliminate fomites, um, a really economic strategy, again, is to go to a concentrate because it can be diluted in specific ratios based on the time you require. Now, when we're talking specifically about canine influenza, the virucidal uh, dilution for this is uh, one to 64, so two ounces a gallon. Um, and the contact time is five minutes to reach effectiveness. So when people think about this, this is, at least for me, a great strategy for daily use. So this is something that you can work into your protocols of how you prepare exam rooms, understanding ahead of time, I need that five minutes. So how can I work sort of on that staggered strategy to make sure that my exam rooms, my treatment areas and the other aspects of my hospital have had that appropriate time, but also is a wonderful strategy for, which we hope never happen again, but probably can, right? Outbreak situations. We're really trying to make sure we're truly eliminating the hospital setting as a fomite. Now just tip number five, and these are just some, I think, tips to remember when we're talking about disinfection, measure, 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 can't say that enough, right? Um, a measuring cup is an essential part of disinfection strategies because we need proper dilutions, not just for safety, but also for efficacy with certain pathogens. And I cannot stress this next one enough, more is not better. I think some people look at dilution ratios and they're like, that's it? How is that gonna be effective? I'll, I'll just add a little more for good luck. We definitely don't want to do that. It's unnecessary. It can create damage, um, sticky floors. Obviously it can waste money and, and certainly not, it's, it's unnecessary. So uh, remember that. And also when we are disinfecting, just like when I said, we need to remove that moisture, that contact time, is essential and then we need to actually wait, set a timer and wait before you wipe it dry because we wanna make sure again that the patients coming in have had the benefit of that effective contact time. And finally, a, a different strategy if you're not a concentrate person but really love wipes, which I absolutely love, wipes are an, another um, outlet for you. The beauty of the wipes is you can see that contact time drops down to one minute. So if you're in a really high volume practice where you're like five minutes sounds great, maybe for my treatment areas, but for my exam rooms, I, I just don't have five minutes. Look at wipes. Wipes for me are awesome. Again, in high volume, wipes are wonderful for me with my stethoscope, my otoscope, ophthalmoscope, um, anything I'm using in that exam room as a tool. If I have a microscope or I'm doing any kind of blood pressure testing, if I need things in the exam room with me, think about how easy it is to have one minute of contact time. Um, so success really kind of looks like this, right? With the wipes, shelf life of three years, that's amazing, right? So we're, they're probably not gonna go to waste, but just like with baby wipes or anything else, you gotta close that lid, 
before you pull the towelette because we will get drying out. Now, another common, um, fairly common response that I've had for people that shift over to using an accelerated hydrogen peroxide is that when you wear certain gloves, there's a pretty distinct odor. And that's because there's a reaction between the sulfur residue on the gloves and hydrogen peroxide. So if you are like, oh, that's it. That's why I, <laughs> I'm reluctant to use this. Here's three options. You can continue to use the gloves and just recognize that that's, it's just that reaction. Switch to a different type of glove, or you can rinse off the gloves with water before you use the wipes so that the residue doesn't interact with the hydrogen peroxide. Um, again, wait before wiping dry, not just with the concentrate, but with the wipes too. Make sure you're refilling them. And then it's really easy to just peel and stick a label on the expiration date. That way it's up to date, easy to track, and you can add it to your standing operating procedures so that it's just a normal part of your hospital disinfection strategy. So as I close up tonight, I'll save room for a few questions, but I, I just wanted to share two really great handouts Fear Free is created around canine influenza. For those of you that want more information for reference, also for those of you that have colleagues that couldn't join us, and certainly those that want to include this for pet parents, uh, the FAQ and, and um, Adam from Fear Free has been kind enough to put this link into the chat right now, so you can certainly find these. Um, the pet professionals, um, handout will be available for people who are uh, fear-free professionals. So that will be uh, a closed access, but the PIP parents one on the left is open access. So even if you are not a member of that fear-free community as of yet, which I certainly hope you become, um, the pet parents one can be used um, certainly to help guide people with other questions. So I'm gonna stop there. I'll leave my email up here if any of you want to reach out with specific questions we don't get to or comments um, or anything else about pain and influenza or if you're having cases yourself and want to have a little bit of help. I, I think I probably, I would also bet I may be one of the probably top five <laughs> Uh, clinicians who have had submitted samples around the country just based on our, our outbreak that we had. So I, I've seen a lot and I'm ha happy to help in any way I can. But Adam, uh, let me turn it back over to you. If there are any questions that I can answer, um, happy to do so. And um, also remember Christy is as well from Virox is in the chat. If you have any specific inform um, uh, questions and technical information around the rescue products. All right, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Marks, for um, hosting tonight's webinar. And we actually do have a, a, a few questions from tonight's chat. Uh, the first one that I would start with is, are canines more susceptible once they get canine influenza or are they immune after they already have it or after they get it once? Yeah, that's a great question. And I think that comes up a lot when people are asking, um, if I just do an initial vaccine with a booster, do I have to keep reboostering, right? Whereas like for me, I had rabies vaccination back in veterinary school. I still have titers to, to that. Um, the, the answer really here is that as of now, this disease does not create lifelong immunity. Um, I wish it did, but unfortunately, just like with humans, it doesn't. And so we also know that as we, we've talked about tonight, right, IgA, uh, an incredibly important immunoglobulin involved in the protection of canines uh, from this disease, unfortunately is sh relatively short-lived, uh, meaning that it doesn't stay in the body for long, long periods of time, which is, again, when we think about mucosal stimulation of respiratory vaccines and some of the other diseases we're trying to protect, um, we do those once to even twice a year in, in other disease states for a vaccination strategy. So this is not one that unfortunately we can say we'll have lifelong immunity and we'd strongly encourage veterinary teams to make sure that we're recommending that yearly booster to stim re-stimulate, re-trigger the body's really nice production of IgA and also um, thinking of course about IgG. Um, so that we can trigger um, that protection, um, again, hopefully indefinitely as we continue to booster along that pet's life. Great. Thanks so much for answering. Uh, our next question is, could you please review how to disinfect a stethos stethoscope? 
Sure. A um, couple different options that you have with a stethoscope. So uh, for me, my preference is using a wipe. It's a little bit easier. I think it's, um, you know, I, I have a little bit better dexterity and I can certainly make sure that I'm getting in all of the aspects. Um, so I'll use an accelerating hydroperoxide wipe and it's one minute of contact time. So that's pretty quick, especially if you are a veterinarian or a technician who's moving you know, quickly room to room. If, for me, I also, if we're talking about stethoscopes, I always recommend having a backup that way, if you have a patient where there is a need, obviously, for immediate disinfection, you have a backup that you can just go on to your next appointment. You don't even have to wait that minute of time. Um, but certainly, you can also use a concentrate diluted appropriately, um, spray that, and obviously wait that five minute of contact time, and then wipe down after dry. So you have two options. Um, like I said, I use the wipe just because it's easier and I feel like I can really get in the crevices and certainly I sort of wrap around and go all the way down the length of my stethoscope and certainly get around the earbuds as well. Um, but you have two different options, certainly, uh, whatever your preference is. All right, and final question. Uh, could you please share any communication tips for when a contagious patient is within the practice. Sure, do you, do you have any context? Is that internal communication like to your team or to the pet parent? Any, any idea? Internal. Internal, internal community, okay, perfect. So anytime you have a, con a potentially contagious patient, whether it's here where we're thinking about potentially canine influenza or we're thinking about um, a zoonotic disease like leptospirosis suspect or you know, even parvo, right? Um, there, there are, I think, a few strategies that are critically important for us. One is immediate documentation around the patient that this patient is a suspect, right? So that's on the chart, that's on the cage, that's immediate communication within the teams, that's in your rounds, that's in your um, you know, new meeting, everywhere that it possibly can, people need to understand what is what that suspect is representing. So let's hear again, obviously, canine influenza. The second thing is immediately isolating that patient. So if that patient warrants hospitalization, that patient should go immediately into an isolation room. My hope would be, <laughs> and I you know, th this is sort of an assumption, I think, because of everyone's familiarity with PPE, but my hope would be that even before you went into a room with a coughing dog, that you would be in pr personal protective equipment for your own protection. But certainly if you weren't, and this was sort of a surprise to you, to immediately get into personal protective equipment. The third thing is, is that we really want to limit the exposure of our team to that patient. So that means whoever is going to be taking care of that patient is limited to that patient alone and not going from your isolation back into your regular hospitalization or treatment or exam rooms. So you're trying to truly isolate your team and the patient. So we're limiting exposure back and forth. The fourth thing would be, of course, communication to the pet parent of why all this is happening, right? Um, and that ob obviously often happens concurrently. And then the fifth thing is to make sure that your isolation unit um, is as stacked as possible so that any treatments, any, and again, this hopefully is done ahead of time, but sometimes it, it isn't, um, any treatments, any uh, diagnostics, any therapies that you're going to be doing in hospital, like coupage, um, oxygen delivery, respiratory PCR testing, whatever it is, can be done in that confined space. And again, isn't going into your treatment area. The final thing, of course, which we closed on tonight, is effective disinfection of the, the exam room, lobby, wherever that patient has been and wherever you have been as the person associated with that patient. So in those cases specifically, if you're talking about a contagious patient, I do not tend to go to wipes. I tend to go to the concentrate at the appropriate dilution and leave the entire room and entire area sprayed for that five minutes. Um, because what I find is, is if I go to wipes, I don't tend to be, and this is, my, this is my own personal, I'm not saying any of you, but I don't tend to be as thorough necessarily. And remember dogs, I also, I'm, I'm taking, thinking about the patient. I'm not thinking about, well, that dog was only on the table. Well, maybe the dog was on the ground for a little bit or 
Um, I only touch the dog with the otoscope. I didn't, but you know, we forget things. So I like to make sure I use the concentrate diluted, cover that entire area and set that timer for that five minute of contact time. Because remember, we're not going to have a diagnosis immediately. So it could be a co-infection with either, with even, uh, again, a longer time for our hospital to be a fomite. And then once everything is taken care of, of course, we dispose of our PPE appropriately and get that patient um, hopefully stable enough for discharge. For me, I definitely like to have my patients that are contagious. When they are stable, I like them home, right? Because it does, it, 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 even though we have isolation units, it, it never fails that it is more challenging to contain them in the hospital than at home. If, they, if we have a confident pet parent that can, and certainly also from an emotional health perspective, if they can be medicating appropriately at home, again, with a stable respiratory patient, I would welcome them to be there and isolating there in the comfort where they have the best physical, emotional health um, and best possible outcomes. Fantastic. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Marks. I would also like to thank everyone for uh, attending and our friends at Virox for making today's presentation possible. Uh, for any additional questions for our participants, you are welcome to reach out to Natalie at her email, which is displayed on the screen, or contact our Fear Free team at wags at fearfreepets.com. Thank you to everyone joining. I hope you have a, a wonderful night and hopefully a great weekend ahead. And um, I hope this was some really practical tips to help you have a better handle on canine influenza and just also how we can have that safe, effective practice without us being a, a source of transmission for disease too. Hope to see you again soon. <laughs>